Good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to the 2021 Mason Public Leadership Lecture with President Rafael Bostic of the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta. This lecture is part of the Terry Leadership Speaker Series, which has brought many distinguished leaders from the public and private sectors to the University of Georgia campus to educate and to inspire our students. Today's honored speaker, President Bostic, will participate in a discussion moderated by Allison Fine, a Mason Law Scholar from the University of Georgia School of Law and a Leonard Leadership Scholar alumna. We're fortunate to have the namesake of the Mason Public Leadership Lecture here with us this morning. Keith Mason is a loyal University of Georgia alumnus who served as a trustee of the UGA Foundation for over a decade. This lecture series reflects one of Keith's passions and an important component of the UGA experience that is, public leadership. He shares my belief that this university, the birthplace of public higher education in America, has a responsibility to produce outstanding leaders for our state, our nation, and indeed the world. We're indebted to Keith and his wife, Twinker, who is also with us today, for their generosity in supporting this lecture series and for all that they do each and every day to support the University of Georgia. Please join me in welcoming them to our campus. <laughs> Following the conclusion of today's discussion, Keith will offer some concluding remarks and we will look forward to hearing from him at that time. At this time, I'm gonna turn the program over to our outstanding Dean of the Terry College of Business, Ben Ayers, to introduce our guest speaker and our student moderator, Dean Ayers. Thank you, President Moorhead. I too would like to thank Keith Mason for establishing this lecture, which underscores an important element of success in life as well as in business, and that's public leadership. Through attention and action, true public leaders demonstrate that success in their fields is also defined by the contribution they make to others, and today's speaker is such a leader. President Rafael Bostic serves as the 15th president and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta, in that position, he's responsible for all of the institution's activities, including monetary policy, bank supervision and regulation, and payment services. He also serves on the bank's Federal Open Market Committee. Before joining the Federal Reserve, he held the Judith and John Bedrosian Chair in Governance and the Public Enterprise at the University of Southern California, where he served as a professor in the School of Policy, Planning, and Development where he was a principal advisor to the Secretary on Policy and Research. A native of New York City, he graduated from Harvard University in 1987 and earned a PhD in economics from Stanford University in 1995. He served on many boards and advisory committees, including the California Community Reinvestment Corporation, Abode Communities, Neighbor Works, the National Community Stabilization Trust, the Urban Land Institute, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, the American Real Estate and Urban Economics Association, the National Economic Association, as well as Freddie Mac. Moderating today is Allison Fine. Allison is a Keith Mason Scholar here at the University of Georgia Law School. She's also a 2021 graduate from the University of Georgia, majoring in political science, as well as marketing in the Terry College of Business. And she is also a Leonard Leadership Scholar. Please join me in welcoming today's speakers. Good morning and welcome to the Mason Public, Lecture, Public Leadership Lecture Series. 
My name is Allison Fine, and I'm so excited to be moderating our discussion today. Um, if you're ready to get started, thank let's, you so much for joining us. Let's do it. <laughs> All right. Um, so it's obviously been a very challenging year, year and a half, really, for the whole world. And it's resulted in changing a lot of the ways that we go about doing things in our daily lives. As someone responsible for leading an organization, how has your leadership style adapted in order to accommodate some of these changes? So that's, a, that's actually a very good question. And you know, one of the challenges that we had in this is that things happen so suddenly that you know, on, it was like a Wednesday or a Thursday and we just decided no one's coming into the building anymore. And uh, we really had to adapt very quickly. For, for me, I think, as I think about our, our leadership and how we tried to engage with our staff, uh, it was, there were three elements to this. The first was just to tell them, we don't know what's coming. So we're just going to communicate with you as often as we can, as regularly as we can, as we're learning things, so that you know exactly what we know and there's not that un uncertainty. Um, the second thing, which I didn't really expect would be real, is that uh, you know, we had always said that you should bring your whole self to work. Uh, during the pandemic, people brought themselves to work in ways I never imagined. You'd, you'd have them on a Zoom screen and the kid would run through or the dog would start barking. And we had to really show people that it was real, that was true. Uh, and I think that was um, eye-opening, and it's kinda, it, it kind of brought our relationships closer together. Um, and then the third thing was really um, a deeper trust that we had to put into our staff to say, um, so you guys, the Fed, we're a central bank, very conservative, we don't really do things like work from home and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but we didn't have a choice in this instance, and so we just had to trust that they were going to be able to do their job and be great, and um, you know, our staff stepped up very much so, but you know, we tried to be very clear that we trusted them and their judgment to, uh, to get the work done the way they needed to get it done, and I think that kind of, um, of transparency and openness to the staff was, uh, was important. Let me add one other thing. Um, I'm gonna do this several times, so to add one other thing, uh, is that um, we made it clear what our priorities for them were, which was first and foremost their, their health and safety, and that everything we did was to try to maximize that and reduce their stress and uncertainty in their personal lives. And we really tried to make it a personal relationship and experience between our team and our institution uh, and you know, through the pandemic, I've just heard from so many people that that's the thing they appreciate more than anything else, that, 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 that we acknowledged that they were going through stress, they were having hard times, and we just spoke to it, and we were open to it and said, you guys need to deal with that. That's been very important. I definitely agree. The openness and transparency with communication, I'm sure, was instrumental. I know a lot of us probably felt the same with how we dealt with that on the academic side. <laughs> Um, sort of in line with that, and in the business school, we talk a lot about the importance of being able to pivot. And I was wondering, how do you maintain this degree of flexibility, but also a degree of consistency and stability for your organization? So, you know, I, I don't think I pivot very much. And, and I, say this, <laughs> I say this in the sense that I don't think I, I approach things being stuck on a course or a path. And uncertainty and new things coming in is always something that I'm expecting. And so this was like a hyper level of that. Like this was all a, a really extreme case of uncertainty. But I've really been, uh, I try to approach things by recognizing there are going to be a lot of forces that we're going to have to engage with that I'm not going to control. And as long as I'm open to that and, and, and prepared to have those things introduce themselves and then try to figure things out in real time with my team, uh, then I think I'm in a good place to be ready to deal with whatever seems to happen. Uh, and, and that's been helpful. So, so for me, I think being open to the chaos, if you will, um, is, is an important thing. And it's hard. Now, now I will say, you know, um, that you know, I was raised as an academic, and, and you know, when you're a professor, uh, you do all your research, you collect all the data, you do all the manipulation, you write it up, you do the re revisions, and it's all about self-reliance. And subsequently, I control everything. 
uh, to do the chaos space where, you, where you're not gonna control everything, which is actually what most of the world is, um, it requires, um, I was thinking like a level of Zen and to say, okay, I'm gonna control what I control and everything else, we're just gonna let it happen and then we'll respond to it. I try to stay very um, front forward in that space. To say, okay, I, I, Zen, deep breaths, inhale, exhale, and now deal with whatever, whatever comes. And, um, and that's been very, very helpful uh, because you know, in the last what, two years, 18 months, so many things have happened that were just not even in my mindset. <laughs> and you know, if I had needed to like, fully uh, be, like, recognize that it happened first and then have to wrestle with it, that would have been a lot harder than, okay, things are happening, and we just have to live with that. So it's like a mindset of welcome the unexpected, maybe if you can't necessarily always expect what might be unexpected. Yes, I, I, like, how, I like how you said that. Um, yeah, because the unexpected is always going to come. So. so in the ILA program, students spend a lot of time discussing their personal values and their professional values and how those are going to interact to impact a legacy that they hope to leave. What are some of your leadership values and how do you think that those have impacted your legacy and will continue to do so? Um, so the first for me is um, I want my team to know that I'll do any task required to get a job done. There are, there are no tasks that are beneath me or that I shouldn't be expected or asked to do. Um, and, and that's really part and parcel of I am part of the team while leading the team as well. Um, and, and for me, I think uh, the value in that is that in addition to uh, me saying like every job and every role is important, it sends a message that it's not my team, it's our team, and that we all need to own our effort and, and the outcome, we're all responsible for it. So that's the first thing. Uh, a second value is um, to, to believe that uh, value and talent and insight can come from anyone. Uh, yeah, one of the things that I really work hard to do is uh, project a, a pers uh, an expectation that if you're in a room or if you're in a meeting or if you're on a team, um, that you have things to bring to it and that you will be bringing those things forward. Um, and I, I, just a quick story. So when I was at, uh, at HUD as an assistant secretary, uh, the very first meeting, um, uh, we have a big conference room table, and no one is sitting at the table. Like everyone, there are chairs around on the wall, everyone is sitting at the wall. And it was, they were sending a message like, we don't expect to actually have to say anything, and we don't expect to be really participating in this meeting. And my view is if you're in the meeting, you should be participating, or else you should go do something else, right? And so I actually waited, we, we, I said, we're not gonna start the meeting till Every chair at the table is filled. Uh, and they didn't believe me, so I waited. And then I waited. And then two people got up. Anyway, I waited a long time. But, it was, but you have to send these messages that you know, every staff member is valuable. And you have to be willing to do things to show that you take that seriously. Um, and that's the second thing. And then the third thing I would say is I really try to be like personal with people and really uh, engage with them in a non-hierarchical way. Uh, you know, if, when I walk through our building, um, sometimes it takes me a long time to get to the elevator because people want to talk and they want to engage. But for me, I feel like that engagement in regular time is going to lead to better engagement in stress time because we will have had the experience and, and the, 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 um, the, just the muscles and the familiarity so that when you get to harder times, you still communicate and people will tell you hard things and people will will tell me difficult things, because uh, those are the things that I need to know. Like, so, I, yeah, I, there's a whole lot to say on be, like, being told difficult things, but I would just say the most valuable staff I have are staff who tell me things I don't want to hear or, or things that I may not believe, because that's when I get challenged, and that's when I make sure I don't uh, miss something that's going to lead me to misstep. So, so it's really important to have a team that will tell you what they really think so that you know, I have an opportunity to um, deliberate on the full set of information. And by having closer and, and familiar relationships, I think that's easier to, to happen.
So it definitely sounds like having reciprocal relationships with uh, individuals are, is important to you. I guess it kind of sounds like this mindset of a culture of shared responsibility between you and your team members to really all be working towards whatever goal is in sight for you. So, so that's right, but I, I also think, um, I know I don't have all the good ideas. And I know I don't have every insight. And if we're gonna get the most out of all of us, then everybody's gotta be willing to put up ideas and put up insights. And so it's, it's like we definitely share responsibility, but I feel like uh, it, it's also very important that we um, get collective wisdom. And that collective wisdom only comes from having an environment where people will say the things that are on their mind, uh, have the ideas and the reflections become part of our collective deliberation uh, because you know, the wisdom of the crowds is real. And, and we will be better for that. So how do you think that your leadership values have changed from maybe when you were in our shoes as a college student or a soon-to-be graduate um, to where you are now as the leader of an organization? So, you know, it's funny, I'm not sure I had any leadership values when I was your age. Um, uh, I really did assume that this leadership just happened and people were good at it. And uh, experience, you know, is a hard teacher sometimes. And that I can be in organizations and, and see that um, there's really bad leadership where the leader is not actually doing things to have the sum be more than the parts or the whole be more than the sum of the parts. Uh, and um, it made me reflect. So uh, back to HUD, um, there were just a lot of things that weren't happening um, in my group when I took over that needed to happen. And, and I was first astounded that they weren't happening. But then rather than, than wallow in shock and sadness, uh, you had to get up and do something. And so really it made me think hard about, well, what are the pillars that are essential if my organization is gonna be functional? Uh, and um, that sort of got me to, you know, we have to communicate with everyone on a regular basis. We need to talk to people and, and solicit their input and treat them with respect. We need to promote um, innovation and insights. You know, you know one of the things that, you know, that, and this is true in almost every situation, leaders don't have time to know every detail of an issue. Uh, and so I get briefed all the time on an issue or a question, and um, my biggest frustration is when the briefing doesn't have a recommendation. Because I'm thinking about this for 15 minutes, and I'm in a room of people who've been working on this for 15 years. Why would you expect my 15 minutes of reflection to be better or higher quality than your 15 years of experience? And so creating an environment where people are allowed to have an opinion and expected to express it um, is essential for, um, for, for, for better decision making, for crisper decision making, and not having to go back and sort of uh, revisit things because there was some detail I didn't know about that other people in the room could have just told me, oh, well, you can't do that because that's, that's dumb, right? And, and, and so that's kind of the, the um, where my journey has been in that space. Um, and it's, it's actually been very, very interesting. I, I have a, a tremendous respect for what all of you guys are doing in terms of trying to have a perspective and vision on leadership from the very beginning. Um, because it will, I think it will cause you to sort of um, observe your environment in a different way. And I think learn lessons uh, much faster and in much crisper ways than I did. Um, and, and that'll serve you much better sort of throughout the course of your career. Was there ever a time that your values have been put to the test? And how did that impact you or lead you to change or not change what you were doing? So, um, all the time. <laughs> and, and I, you know, um, I don't know how to say this elegantly. So, so what I'll say is we all have principles about how we want to do our work and how we want to interact with people and how we want to do uh, embrace evidence and how we want to speak to decision making and logic and all those sorts of things. Um, and pretty much every day there's going to be a setting where something happens that doesn't really align with that. And you have to make a decision. Are you going to call the question? Are you going to stop things and say, okay, this doesn't sound right to me or you know, I, we should, maybe we should hear some other people or 
And you have to decide whether you're going to do that or not. Um, I'm going to, uh, this is going to be a longer answer. So uh, early in your career, I would say pause. Because sometimes there are organizations, there's a history as to why certain things haven't happened, and there's value in sort of learning what that history is and understanding how it all fits together. But the more experience you have, the more straightforward it is and the easier it is to sort of discern whether it's, um, there's a historical context or whether this is just something where this is not working. And uh, when you're in that, that latter setting, you have to decide, okay, I see this isn't working. Am I gonna say something or am I gonna sit on my hands? And what I've tried to do is always say something, uh, make sure it's smart, Right, so this is not about sort of having an attitude or uh, stomping your feet or anything. You, like, you want to be smart and constructive to try to get to a better place. Um, but it also has to be consistent. So wh wherever it's not working, you just got to be the same, whether it's to people who are subordinate to you or people who are above to you. you the same message, the same approach, uh, that consistency in engagement and interaction winds up becoming a reputation. And when you have that reputation, uh, people will want you to be on their teams because they know you will say exactly what you think, it will be smart, it'll have insight and wisdom, uh, and it'll make ideas and projects go better. Uh, so that, that consistency of approach, I think, has, has been something um, that, um, that I've tried to do. I mean, it, it shocks people, so people will be like, did you really just say that with so-and-so in the room? It'd be like, yeah, so because it needed to be said. Um, but it, if you do it in the right way, people will hear it the right way, and that's, what's, uh, that's really where the value is. I think that's really good advice for all of us, especially as we are starting into the new part of our uh, next step with careers and... Yeah, so, you know, it's, 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 um, it's a funny thing, because uh, you just triggered a thought. So, you know, when I was teaching public policy, in, in my first lecture, I would always say, um, anytime you have a question in your head, is, which is, why don't we just? You should never ask that question. Because why don't we just assumes that people have not reflected on things, and there's some obvious, straightforward, easy thing that we should just, and you all are just a bunch of idiots. And that is almost never the case. Uh, so, so for me, that's another one of my checks. If I have a, why aren't we just doing this? And it's like, there's something I clearly don't understand. Let me try to figure that out and, and really um, get to a better place so I can be more constructive. That's a good, I've never thought about putting it like that. Because I feel like that's often just our initial response. But uh -huh. I'm sure all the time people are like, oh, we've thought about that. There's a very good reason why that's not the case. So I know that one of your primary areas of interest is working to create a more inclusive economy. First, could you explain to us what exactly that means and then how we as society and we as individuals can go about working to achieve that? Um, so when I think about an inclusive economy, it really is having an economy that works for everyone, where um, access to opportunity is um, readily available in all contexts and in every, every walk of life. Um, and that's hard to do. Like we have a historical context where you know, access is not evenly distributed. Uh, and if you don't have access evenly distributed, people with the same levels of talent and the same types of innovation will have very wi wildly different outcomes. And then we wind up being less for that. So trying to get to a place where um, your, it's your ideas, your energy, your commitment, your hard work that, that determines your uh, outcome, uh, much more than the the structures and the institutions and the networks that you happen to have uh, available to you, uh, we will be in a better place. So we are working really hard at our bank to, um, let's say this in two ways. So we're working hard in our bank to make that real within our bank. So we try to make sure that every staff member, um, we know sort of their context, where they've come from, um, what their aspirations are, and then try to make sure that they know what kind of resources are available to them. Uh, but we also are trying to do this external to the bank, um, in the communities in the sixth district where we serve, uh, to really ask the question, like, is the economy working for you? Is the economy working for everyone? 
If not, what do you think the barriers are? Uh, and then can we get and figure out, get approaches and figure out strategies and solutions to deal with those barriers? You know, this morning I was just, just talking at a rural prosperity summit talk and um, the economy is not working for many rural places. And so it's, it's incumbent upon us to work with those communities to figure out like, what things might they do to, to get better off. And, and so uh, for me, I, I think this is part and parcel of the mission of the Federal Reserve. Our, our mission one is, is to maximize employment. And you get maximum employment when everyone who wants a job has one, but that's not enough. That job has also got to be one where we get their maximum potential. So it's sort of what kind of investment do we put in them? Do they put on themselves to get human capital? Uh, and what kind of opportunities do they have in terms of working to be more productive moving forward? And if we can get to that, like the sky's the limit on where this, this country can go. And um, it's become more important because you know, we're more global, we're more, the competition comes from more places, uh, and so the challenges are harder. And so I just feel like we're in a place where we cannot afford to uh, waste potential and squander it. And so we need to get the most we can out of it. As society has obviously changed so much over the years, and I'm sure we'll continue to do so, do you think that this is a goal that is not necessarily has an end to it, but is something that will always require adapting and evolving with uh, society as it changes? Um, yeah, that's a very good question. I, so I don't think we'll ever stop striving for this. And um, I think we're all on a journey uh, to uh, try to realize our best, our best selves. And um, even when you have access, full access opportunity, you're gonna continue to grow. Uh, and so um, as, as we get new things, new technologies, new understandings about how the world works, new relationships and new connections, uh, we're going to, we all are going to grow. And so, um, like in our bank, we talk a lot about the journey. Right? We, we, we're on a diversity journey. We're on an agility journey. We're on, we're on a number of journeys where we are trying to build skills to be stronger and better in whatever dimension that we can. Uh, and in none of them is the, con is the notion that, okay, well, we're done, even in, in our minds, because uh, we know we're all imperfect and we're all trying to strive for, for better. And if each of, in, each of us individually has that, then collectively in our societies and our communities, we're gonna have those same challenges where improvement is possible. So you mentioned the mission of the Fed a little bit and the Atlanta Fed has values of respect, integrity and excellence. And coincidentally, those are three of ILA's five core values. So I was wondering if you could speak as to why these are the values that the bank has chosen to embody. So let me uh, start this by just giving you a sense of where those came from. So those weren't three values that, you know, a couple of executives sat in the room and figured out, like, well, we're just gonna pick integrity, excellence, and respect. Uh, it was a, a multi-year journey uh, before I started. My, my predecessor decided we needed to have values that we were going to embrace, and they went on a year-long listening session and would have small group meetings with staff members all throughout our 1,700-person organization. And these were three that bubbled up, uh, and eventually they, they became a consensus set of, of values. When I think about the three of them, excellence, you know, we got to do great work. Uh, the, our mission is very important. Uh, we can't afford to do that half-cocked. So we need to make it sharp and, and, fir and firm. Uh, integrity, uh, we are serving the public interest, and we need to do that in a way that um, never calls into question our motives, our, our approaches, or our perspectives, uh, and also with our constituents. So when we, 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 we supervise banks, we need to engage with them straightforward in a way so that they know what our, our interests and our mission is and we're perspective and uh, our perspective and also all, all of our communities um, and also with each other. Right? If you're gonna have teams that are gonna be fully functional, uh, you have to have that integrity so that when, when you speak, it, it means what it means. And then respect, you know, the respect of the three values, respect was the one that was the, I, what, I've been, what I've been told is had the most discussion. 
uh, because respect can mean a lot of different things. Uh, for us, it's really about um, um, seeing value in all of the people, and this is how I would say it, seeing value in all the people who we interact and engage with, and treating them with that value in mind. Uh, so that means um, embracing diversity and equity and inclusion. Uh, it means uh, embracing uh, the idea that there are gonna be different perspectives and it's okay to have a different view and that you should voice those things. Um, it means all of these things to say that um, we're not requiring agreement or consensus. We're requiring respect and an expectation that, um, that whoever is speaking has, a, has thought about this and they have something to add. You know, I, I, I mentioned our agility journey. Um, there's a phrase I, I try to keep in my mind all the time now, and it wasn't the one that I had, and it's people positive. And you know, I try to stay people positive at all times um, to, to, to assume that when someone's saying something, it's because they care and they have a passion and a commitment to us. And I may violently disagree with it, but if it's people positive, then it's something that I definitely need to take on board and consider and think about and, um, and show that I acknowledge and value that they said whatever they said. And, and you know, we've been trying to do this, so we we've just did a, a vaccine mandate uh, for our institution. Uh, we got some angry emails back from people. And, uh, we and our leadership team reached out and engaged every person who sent us an email to say we heard what you said, we don't necessarily agree with it, uh, but we respect and we're glad that you told us what you thought and we respect whatever decision you make. Uh, and that's the type of institution I think we strive to be and I think my, our staff really appreciates um, that perspective and that approach. I like that, the people positive, that's a good way to, to put it. So you've talked a lot about the values and why they're so important, but how do you as a leader work to integrate these into the daily operations among, I think you said 1,700 employees? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, you have to live them. And when you're tested, you have to lean back on them. And uh, the third thing is you have to tell people that's what you're doing. I, so I do feel like um, a lot of times you'll be doing all the things, but if you don't tell people that you're doing them, they may not notice it or see it that way. They may interpret it as being something different. So this gets back to the communication and trying to be fully transparent about, um, about why you're doing the things that you're doing in addition to the what, transparency on the what you're doing. And so we, we talk about our values a lot and we talk about how it manifests itself in many, many different spaces uh, from big groups to just small meeting groups and uh, try to live it. You know, I, I, when I first started, I had a lot of small group meetings, whereas me and like 10 staff members, uh, and it was like, we're gonna talk about whatever you wanna talk about. And they didn't really believe that, that's what, but that's really what it was. And once that happened, um, that's sending a message. I respect you. I believe you have excellence and perspectives that you can bring and that you have the integrity to not misrepresent, misrepresent things. Like, so, so by living those values, um, that becomes sort of the, the, the ethos of an organization. Yeah, I think it's really important to, like you were saying, live them, but also be able to communicate them. And I feel like in order to do that, you have to really know what your values are and why they matter. Well, you know, one thing we've done is that on the back of every ID now, we have the values written. So, you know, I, you know, there have been so many things that have happened that have challenged um, us as a community, us as a society, where people have started to question whether I belong or, um, you know, well, am I safe or, or, or do I have a home? Uh, and, you know, I just felt that it was important that every staff member remember what our values are. So they never had to ask that question about our institution. And uh, we have something called the big a values wall where we have excellence, integrity, and respect on this giant wall. Um, and a couple exercises behind it. We have that wall uh, replicated in every one of our facilities now. So when you walk into the facility, you see our values every day. And so we're trying to find ways to have those really be present in people's lives as they think about and connect with our organization. That's awesome. Uh, shifting gears a little bit, so your role is obviously to serve the sixth district, but I'm sure you spend a lot of time also working with the other district presidents. 
And I'm sure that maybe the needs of our district don't always align with that of the overall system. So how do you go about balancing the interests of the 6th district with the interests of the overall Federal Reserve System? So that, that's a good question. Um, I'll, say this, I'll answer this two ways. So one, I think we all have the same mission. So you know, at a very basic level, we're, try, we're all trying to get to the same place. And that's something I try to keep very, keep very much in my mind. We all have different approaches and strategies and philosophies on, on how to get there. But that's an important first thing. Then the second thing is um, we don't all have to do everything together all the time. And you know, I've, I've tried to get comfortable with that, and I've tried to get my team comfortable with that, that um, we, we can have differences of opinions about best courses, and that's OK. Um, we want to make sure that, everyone, that, be, that others are not doing things that run counter to those, and we got to have those conversations. But to the extent that, that things are moving forward in a positive way, that, that's, that's fine. You know, we just start, we, for the last year, we've been doing a Racism in the Economy webinar series. And um, it started off with just three of the reserve banks doing it because we all thought this was a good thing to do and uh, we weren't sure anybody else did. So we just went. And then over time, we've, we've grown into consensus. And that kind of experience, I think, uh, has been useful to say, you know, we can start with small and small can become bigger. And uh, we, I would try to stay open to that. What do you think is an essential characteristic of a leader in today's world, and how do you think that someone can go about developing that? Um, so essential characteristic, I think in today's world is increasingly transparent communication. Uh, you know, we are uh, in a space now where information flows incredibly fast, and that means that um, people can be pulled in their viewpoints and perspectives to places that may not be in our institutional interest. Uh, and so we need to, so leaders are increasingly going to be challenged to uh, create a, uh, a strong and consistent and clear message that all of their staff and all of their customers and all of their constituents can understand and can trust in um, over time and as things change. Uh, so, I, so I think that's, that's what it is. In terms of, of how you learn that, you just have to do it. And you know, I think, yeah, and this is again for, for young people in particular, the hardest hard conversations are the first hard conversations. And you know, what you'll learn is that if, if, as you approach things um, in a people positive way, that's respectful, um, those hard conversations will turn out better than you expect it. And that is something to build on and to sort of uh, nurture because um, that's really where you start to say, okay, transparency actually works. And if people understand you and know the, the, the motives and the heart in you that's driving what you're saying, um, they'll hear it the way you want them to hear it. And then you together will get to a better place. I like that, and it definitely seems to all tie back in together of the consistency of communicating and being open with those around you in order to effectively lead a team and all work together. Um, so I think that we are out of time for me to ask you questions, but I know that the audience probably has a ton. So I believe Dean Ayers is now going to help facilitate a Q&A with uh, the students that are here. Thank you, Allison. We do have a few minutes for a couple of questions. So if you have a question, if you'll raise your hand here in front. Hello. Uh, thank you for speaking up with us today. My name is Billy Barber, and I'm a senior finance major and a fellow in the IRA class. Uh, my question for you is that for graduating Terry seniors such as myself, the news about inflation rates, job market, returning to normal is taunting. And what is one piece of advice you have for students in my place uh, starting their career in finance in this kind of environment? So I would say um, two pieces of advice. One is stay calm. It will work out. Uh, you'll, you'll get to something that, that, will, um, that will be good. Um, and then the second is be open to opportunity. Uh, through the course of uh, the last three jobs I've had, none of them were on my radar 18 months before. And in my, my current role, I didn't think about this as an option six months before I was offered the job. So, 
be open to the possibility that there are things out there that are going to come to you that are going to be magical uh, that you do not know and are, you are not expecting. And that can be, um, be very, very powerful. Um, uh, so, so that's what I would say. And then the, I'm going to say one more thing, uh, which is it's okay to make a mistake. Like early on, like learning is learning. And you, you're not always going to find the perfect thing in the first stab. And then I'm going to add one more thing, which is every experience is, should be, every experience should help you find your passion and find and, and help you learn more about uh, how you like to work, what things you're good at and what things you're not good at. And grow in all of your experiences. Is there anything you could ask for uh, that first career as well, not just getting there? But... Be a sponge. I, so whatever your first career is, ask a lot of questions because there's, there's some factual detail that is important, but there's also all the cultural stuff, there's all the leadership stuff, there, there's so many aspects to work, um, and you're, you, so, so really understanding how that culture and environment emerged and got to where it is, um, that's really valuable. The more information you get at an early age, the better you'll be down the road because you will have reflected on a lot of these things. Time for one more question, yes? In the back, yeah. Uh, President Bostic, thanks for speaking with us today. My name is uh, Tom Williams, senior scholar, leadership scholar. Um, you mentioned the importance of thorough decision making in a public leadership role, um, and how important it is to kind of take a step back, look at the facts, analyze the data, make an informed decision. Can you speak a little bit to how that process occurs in a team setting, both in your district and across the state as a whole, and how you kind of weigh it? especially when it comes to maybe unprecedented issues like a national pandemic or the adoption of a digital currency? Just small things in the <laughs> introduction of the pandemic. Um, so so two, two things. Uh, so one is that in almost every setting, you're going to have to make a decision without perfect information. So you're going to have information, but it will never be complete. It will never be all that you could possibly get. And at some point, you just have to make a decision. So, so with that, the goal is to get as much information as you can in as timely a way as possible so that uh, when it's time to, to flip the switch, you have as much as you can. But you're still going to have to be able to just make something uh, happen. So what we do, we spend a lot of time creating an infrastructure that uh, facilitates the rapid um, collection of information from a broad set of sources. And to be completely frank, it's not an infrastructure we had going into great, the Great Recession. And as a consequence, I think we didn't have as much information as we could have as the Atlanta Fed, but also as the Federal Reserve System of the Central Bank to understand the depth of the economic crisis that was emerging. And so in response to that, we actually created this infrastructure to say we need to do a whole lot better to get more get information from more sources. Uh, so we have something we call a regional economic information network. I got a couple of my staff members here who are part of that, and they collect information in Georgia. Uh, but that has been a game changer. And it's been, and it, the irony is, you know, a pandemic, um, all the data you get at a macro level is from last month, last quarter, two months ago, like in the back. And pandemic, things are changing now. Like that stuff in the past is not actually helpful for understanding what's going on moving forward. And so this infrastructure has actually become even more important than I think any of us could have imagined as we move forward. And I think it's been very helpful for me uh, in having comfort in the direction of our policy as we've been grappling with so many unprecedented events all at the same time. Thank you, President Bostek. Thank you for your inspirational words. Thank you for your leadership impact you're having on the 6th District and obviously on the state of Georgia, city of Atlanta, and here in Athens as well. I've got a gift for you that's a small token of our appreciation for you being here. So now I would like to invite today's sponsor, Keith Mason, to join me at the podium for a few completing remarks.
Thank you, Dean Ayers, and uh, thank you, President Moorhead, for your uh, remarks earlier today. It's uh, been my honor to uh, sponsor this lecture. Uh, the purpose of it has been, and still it remains, as you can tell from the remarks uh, today on, by our guest speaker, to plant uh, seeds of, of public leadership in our uh, students here at the University of Georgia, and in particular among the, our College of Business graduates. Uh, we have a, a, a lot of great uh, business leaders in our uh, state and community, such as President Bostic. Uh, also, we have with us today one of the members of our uh, Board of Regents and a, and a great University of Georgia alum, uh, Kessel Stelling, who has exhibited a lot of public leadership in his own right. And it's uh, my honor to have had President Bostic here. He is a, a one of the nation's great, innovative, and inclusive uh, public leaders, not just in the area of what he does at, at the Fed on, on finance, but also in on issues that affect our community at large. And I'm honored to have had him. Uh, Allison, we're proud of you and, what, and the work you're doing here uh, at the University of Georgia and both um, in your undergraduate work, but also currently in the law school. And thank all of you for your participation. Thank you. That concludes our presentation. Hope everyone has a great rest of the week, and of course, go dogs. <laughs>